So we just keep it really simple. Let's just start. I'll just sing a little, we'll sing a little prayer. And, but it's got meaning, you know. It's got meaning. There are two meanings in this little prayer. The first two lines are for anybody in the room who already kind of identifies with being a Buddhist and using Buddha's tools. So it's kind of reiterating our reliance on the Buddha. And the second two lines are just really for all of us. It's expressing the, 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 the Tibetans would say, we, you know, when you do an action, you, you set your motivation. Well, we might say, state our purpose, state our goal. What's the purpose of our being here together for an hour and a half today? Well, let's think it's simply to listen to, think about, listen to, and even though I'm talking, I'm listening, I promise, to Buddha's views about things, about life, about happiness, about suffering. And the, the way to listen is, is to listen to it as advice. But you mightn't take it, and that's okay. You're, you're the boss, not Buddha. But it is advice. Hear it in that way. So try and hear how you can apply it practically. That's the point. And advice for what? Well, it's very simple. Advice for how to develop our own amazing potential. And we're going to talk about this. Buddha's pretty incredible, pretty radical in what he suggests is our human potential. For our sake and for the sake of others, because we live in this crazy world together. So thinking like that, okay. I'll just sing this little prayer. If you know it, you join in. Sange charang soke chognam la, jang chu badu dagni kyab suchi, dagi chan yen gi pe sonam ki, drola penche sange drupa shog. Sange charang soke chognam la, jang chu badu dagni kyab suchi, dagi chan yen gi pe sonam ki, drola penche sange drupa shog. Sange charang Jang soke chog nam la, jang chu badu dagni kyab suchi, dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki, drola penchir sangi drupa shok. Okay. So it sounds sort of exciting to be our own therapist, doesn't it? It sounds kind of, ooh, what's that mean? And it sounds like a good marketing ploy, and it is. But it's literally true, you know, literally true. That really is what, it, if, you're, if you're attempting to be a Buddhist, you're, trying, you're learning to become familiar with your own mind. Why? Well, it's, you know, the whole of Buddhism actually is, it, it ends up, the goal of being a Buddhist, the practice of being a Buddhist, the methodology that you follow, if you're doing it all the way, will lead you to the end result where you, where you become a Buddha. So that word is really tasty. The, me the meaning of that word, you know, the etymology of that word, what it implies, immediately tells us the job to be done. So it's extremely simple in one way, but although it's the hardest job we'll ever do. So the word Buddha, or the Tibetan equivalent, Sangye, Sang, Bud, implies <clears throat> the utter eradication from our mind. Now, Tibetans will point here, interestingly. They don't point here. They point here. It's kind of interesting. So the first syllable implies the utter eradication from our being, our mind, ourselves, whatever words you want, of all the stuff that we are intimately familiar with called anger, fears, attachment, jealousy, low self-esteem, you know, neuroses, whatever words you want for the miserable stuff. As soon as we hear what those words, we know they're not nice. And Buddha has found from his own experience, he's done this job himself, he's telling us, that this stuff is not at the core of our being. So if we, you, you know, that, that is already pretty radical. That's kind of shocking, in fact. That's not, there's no, there's no view like that in modern psychology. There's certainly no view like that in neuroscience, because that's how we talk. So we've got to really hear carefully what Buddha means by that, because it's kind of radical. It's kind of shocking, actually. And we're going to talk about that. The second syllable implies that we can develop literally, and they say it this way, to perfection, all the other stuff in our mind. The stuff that we know is nice, love, compassion, kindness, courage, generosity, you know, um, self, uh, contentment, self-confidence, all the words we know are the nice parts of us. So this, these seem almost simplistic, almost simplistic talking this way. We know it seems, you know, when we talk in modern psychological terms, it's way more complex and more, you know, way more complex. This sounds almost decept it's deceptively simple. But this is, this is the basis of the, the approach of being a Buddhist. So if that's the end result, and don't hold your breath, it's a way to go to get there, then it's obvious, it's obvious that implies the methodology. If we can get rid of all the rubbish and grow all the goodness, then we have to obviously learn to know to distinguish between them, identify them, and where are they in our mind. 
So clearly that means we have to know what our mind is. So we'll just mention this in passing because Buddha's view of what the mind is, what the character of the mind is, what its substance is, where it comes from, and indeed as we can just hear it, what its potential is, again is radically different, very different from our modern views. So there's no harm in just hearing this as, as a passing thing and then we'll look into the actual experiential application of these ideas. You know. So from the Buddhist point of view, no, we won't even go into that, what the mind is, but at least we'll say the Buddhist approach is it's a much more um, subjective word. The word is much more, sub it's referring, the mind is just not referring to this piece of stuff in our skull, but it's referring to the actual cognitive process itself of our thoughts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, this entire spectrum of what goes on inside us. That's what Buddha means by mind, or indeed they use the word consciousness. These words are used synonymously. I think in our culture, consciousness has some kind of flavor of being kind of more high. But for the Buddha, they're equal. Mind and consciousness refer to this, this, the workings of what, what goes on inside us, all the way from intellect, all the negative parts of us, the unhappy, the neurotic, the deluded parts of us, all the virtuous, the positive, the intelligence, all this stuff, the emotions, the intellect, the feelings, all of this is our mind, the entire spectrum of our inner being. So the Buddhist approach is we can learn to become unbelievably, intimately, intimately familiar with this stuff to a very subtle degree, with what goes on directly, you know. So that means learning to listen to, to listen to what goes on inside in a very coherent, clear, disciplined way. And that's where this, this you know, what the world knows vaguely as mindfulness meditation, that's where this comes in. It's actually referring to this extraordinary psychological skill invented by these Indians thousands of years before the Buddha, actually. It was His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I, I read a few years ago, and I quote this all the time. He said it was these Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. So we in our Judeo-Christian European culture probably thought it was Freud, you know. What do we know about India? Very little. It's only really now, with many of these amazing Tibetan Buddhist scholars, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who are publishing some of the astonishing literature from India, which is a big surprise to us. I mean, we really mostly track ourselves back to the Greeks, don't we? We don't know much about Africa. We don't know much about Australian Aboriginals. They'll be there very happily for 50,000 years before the white people came along. We know nothing about the, the residents of this country before the white people came along. And we know nothing about India. So it's kind of interesting, you know? We're a little bit self-centred, aren't we? Just as a passing thought. <laughs> So, you know, it, when it, really, it struck me when the Dalai Lama said that. It really made me think, you know, wow, it was these Indians. So what this single point of concentration is, and we really thought about it more deeply and we learned to look at the qualities that you'd develop if you had it, it's really mind-boggling. Like Lama Yeshi says in one of his latest book, Mahamudra, it's a bit like science fiction for us. It's not how we think and talk in our modern psychological methods. That's why we call it religion and we mystify it and stick it in the sky, you know, so we don't take it seriously. So the single point of concentration is actually this, as I said, this marvelous skill invented by these Indians, these great scholar, yogi, you know, saints from centuries ago, that enables you, it's a lot, it takes a while to get there, but enables us to completely harness the kind of the berserk, nonstop, you know, conversations in our head that we know are there at a, a quiet level all the time. We know that. And the, and the Buddha's got the Buddha took this technique from from the Hindus when he diverged in his own direction, in particular in relation to his own direct findings about the nature of self. That's why we have Buddhism now. This is one of the central techniques in Buddhism that's extant for these thousands of years. It hasn't died away. People are now people are looking like you and me. You know, uh, right now somewhere or other in a mountain, metaphorically or otherwise, practicing this skill, learning to harness completely the berserk conceptual stories that we consider are just normal. But the Buddha says are like demented, you know. We can learn to completely subdue them. And this is a really powerful technique, and this is, it'll take us a while to do it if we really succeeded at it. We're able to completely subdue all the crazy conceptual stories to an incredibly subtle degree, but also the sensory consciousness. So this sounds where it, this sounds where it, well, this makes it sound pretty cosmic. But if you saw a person who'd accomplished this single pointedness in 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 Sanskrit, they refer to it as shamatha. In English, it's known generally as calm abiding. If a person had accomplished this, you saw them; they'd look like they were dead. 
And the crucial point being made here, which at least we can take as our hypothesis in this conversation, is that consciousness or mind have much subtler levels that we don't even posit in modern psychology. And this is why these days it's these amazing conversations going on, instigated by the Dalai Lama and his, you know, the Tibetan Buddhists, with some of the best, the best thinkers in our world, bringing together these seemingly very opposite views and finding the common ground. So it means means that people in our culture are looking into these amazing, amazing uh, views coming from India, you know, which is very, very exciting. Forty years now, an organisation called MindandLife.org. You'll see their website. All this stuff's been published. Some of the findings even about, you know, some of the great... One Canadian scientist, I think, that neuroplasticity is one of the greatest findings of the 20th century. What we found is, as a result of doing experiments on the brains of people, we're discovering that we're not stuck with the brain we're born with. We can change our mind. Well, I'm very happy we're catching up with the Buddha. He's been telling us this for several thousand years. You know, they're not stuck with what we're born with. The mind is an infinitely flexible thing. So the crucial point here, of course, is the Buddha's not describing the brain. He's not denying the existence of a brain, but he's not discussing the brain. He's discussing the actual, direct, experiential, subjective, personal, cognitive process itself. So it's very intimate and it's very, you know, often I think in our psychology we don't trust psychology. We don't trust subjective. But this is, this is Buddha's expertise and it's very interesting. So if it is possible that we can rid the mind of all the rubbish, but forget that, even if that implies it's even possible to change it, to, come a bit, to become a bit less neurotic, less miserable, less depressed, which implies more kind, more happy, indeed, as we just said, more happy. And this is one of the ways of describing all of Buddhism. It's the path of stop suffering and getting happiness. So even if it, it tells us we can even learn to change the stuff inside our own mind. That's Buddha's expertise. That's Buddha's expertise. He's not denying the outside world plays a role. It's fairly evident to anybody. He's not denying these things. But his expertise is to enable us to learn to become intimately familiar with our own thoughts, feelings and emotions so that we can then identify them and so that we can then do the job of deconstructing, reconstructing, changing our thoughts, changing our feelings and emotions. That's the job. That's the job of being your own therapist. So the words are simple enough. These are, not, these are not complicated philosophical concepts. These are pretty simple words. We get them. But why is this job the most difficult job we'll ever do? Well, there are various things conspiring against us doing it. The first is that from the second we, we know very well, from the second we wake up in the morning until the second we go to sleep at night, we know that our, all our focus, all our attention is out there. That's, the, that's what senses are. Sensory, sensory consciousness, by definition, is involved in the objects of the senses, which is life out there. People, things, sound, smell, taste. That's where we spend all our attention. The minute we come back into consciousness from sleep, our mind wakes up and we're completely involved with the world out there. So our view in general, and this is reinforced by our, you know, our, our, our modern views, is that what's out there... People, things, sounds, smells, tastes, events. That is where, that's where somehow happiness is and that's where suffering is. So clearly if we want to be happy, we have to search for the things, people, sounds, events, smells, tastes, such that when we have contact with them, happiness is triggered. Good feelings are triggered. And obviously the other stuff is the stuff such that when we have contact with it, suffering occurs and we do not want that. So we can see very well that our pursuit of happiness pretty much is, is, is pursuing the external world, the right, the right amount of people, the right amount of this, the right that, the right job, the right thing, the right weather, the right whatever. And there's nothing, I'm not being moralistic here. We know this. We're intimately familiar with this process. And again, Buddha's not complaining. He's not saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. All he's saying is we're missing the main job. We're missing the main point. We're missing the crucial thing. So he says, yes, it's true. If your boyfriend punches you in the nose, that definitely triggers suffering. He agrees with that. But what he's saying is, and this is where it's difficult, he says, actually, but what goes on in your mind, what goes on in your mind plays the main role in whether or not you're suffering. Equally, why are you happy, Rabina? Oh, David was so kind to me. 
So in this sense, he would put it this way, Buddha says, we're kind of blaming David for your suffering if he punches you in the nose, but we also blame him for our happiness because he was kind to me. In other words, we do put the responsibility onto the outside to be the way we want it so I can have happy feelings. He's not complaining about that. He says, you know, there's a saying in Buddhism, if you can change something, hey, please change it. But what if you can't? And that's where the practice starts. If David's punching me in the nose and I ask him not to just please stop and he stops, then I've solved the problem. But, you know, what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't become, what if the traffic is difficult? What if you can't change the red light to the green light? What are you going to do? And that's where the Buddhist approach kicks in. And this is, you know, Buddha doesn't, I say this really important, it's a really important point. Buddha is not a creator. He does not assert a creator. There is no concept like that in Buddhism. So this whole view of, um, of Buddhist practice isn't kind of, isn't contingent upon believing in a creator and, and living a good life and, and, and you know, that, I mean, and because someone said so. It's, it's, it's a practical issue. Buddha is not a creator. Everything in Buddhism is coming from his experience and he says, here's my methodology, here's what you can get, the, here's the result you can get, so if you'd like to try it out, over to you. It's not a question of believing what he says. It's a question of taking it on board as a hypothesis and trying it for ourselves and then you get the experience, you know. So basically his point is what goes on in our mind, our thoughts and feelings and emotions, they are the main player in our happiness and suffering. So obviously, if that's true, if we want to give that a go, obviously the major, the major thing conspiring against our doing that is all the time putting, it, put it, putting all our attention on the outside. He says we've got to start learning to put attention here. And that's where this concentration meditation comes in, so-called mindfulness. It's a training, it's a practical psychological skill that enables us to focus our mind so that we can step out of our head for a few minutes, and we'll do a little bit today, just, just to try it out. We're training ourselves to step out of our head so we can stay focused, so that even, you know, even then, and, that we, and we bring that skill to bear in our daily life, whereas, and you begin to develop the skill, whereas once when you wake up in the morning, normally if you're not paying attention to your mind, you only pay attention to the hubby and the kids and the this and you're anxious and the watch is in and you're late and you get into the car and you know the anxiety is building up but you don't pay attention to it. You can feel the reverberation of it but there's no awareness of it. There's no intelligent awareness of it. You're just aware of the cars and the this and the traffic and the blah and you're building up the tension and the, the guy jumps in front of you and you want to kill him. Whereas if you start this simple, simple little kind of skill of, of sitting for a few minutes, and I'm really talking about start with decent quality three minutes, forget 20, three, where you train yourself to step out of your head. So inevitably you can't help but notice all the crazy thoughts. They say in the text that when one of the signs of success when you learn to do this kind of meditation is you think you're getting worse. No, you're just noticing, that's all what's there anyway. So we know ourselves that from the second we wake up in the morning until the second we go to sleep, the thoughts are never stopping. Like this unconscious, uncontrolled, unedited chaos in there. We know that. We don't have, we don't think, oh, I think I'll think a thought now. It's just, it's like we've been pulled from pillar to post, aren't we? So we're mainly involved in the outside world. We know the stuff's going on in here, but because we don't pay attention to it, it's only when it roars to the surface and becomes an emotion, we then go, oh, what's going on here? I want to kill my husband. What am I going to do? Well, it's a bit late, isn't it? So this is a practical skill. The Buddha says we can learn to really know what's happening. We can learn to be familiar with it, and this is a crucial point, before it becomes emotional. And this is very interesting. So what's conspiring against us doing this is we, have to, is we, don't, bother to, we don't pay attention until it's too late. And this is really kind of a dumb analogy, I'm going to say, but it's really true. It's like you've, you drive a car, but you've never heard of a mechanics. You've never heard that you can go to the mechanic and have your, job, your car checked and the wheels checked and the oil changed. You've never heard of that. So you drive your car to the ground. And then one day at 100 miles an hour on the freeway, oh, my wheels are falling off. What will I do? Well, a wee bit late, would you not suggest? So, you know, how, why not start to notice the wheels when they wobble? then you is when you then do something about it. So you can argue that your wheels will never fall off. Wheels don't fall off. You might crash, but wheels don't fall off. So that's what our trouble is because we don't pay attention to what's in here and because we believe the outside world is the main player, therefore the cause of my happy feelings and the cause of my suffering feelings. So we spend all our attention trying to manipulate the outside world. When we don't pay attention to the stuff in here, 
in, with any wish to become familiar with it or, or to change it. We just think we're this passive recipient of happiness and suffering. Then, of course, it's going to be, we're well, not going to notice until the wheels are falling off when you want to kill yourself or your husband. Too late. That's why we have so much trauma, because we leave the stuff until we don't pay attention when the wheels are just wobbling. And that's the great skill that Buddhist practice can bring. And this, you, know, you can be a communist and do this. This is not religion. This is not believing. There's masses of stuff about religious looking. I mean, look at these places, you know, look at this, you know. I mean, it's overwhelming by religious images. Look at it. But we're talking the real down-to-earth essence of the Buddhist approach. And, of course, if you, if, you take, if you go into it more deeply, you can take on board all these other techniques, all of which are there anyway to help you do this one job. This is the essence of being a Buddhist. Working on your mind. Bottom line, you know. So we need to learn to pay attention. And then what's still, if we do pay attention, what's conspiring against us really doing the work is because I don't, I, I think when David's mean to me, excuse me, I'm angry, but I'm, a, but I'm allowed to be angry. So we don't want to own it. We don't, we, and our whole culture, our whole approach doesn't enable us to own it because we think, well, David's the problem. What do you mean I should change? We're shocked if Buddha says, you know what, Rabina, you can change your, you can change your mind. How, why should I? I'm not wrong. David should change. That's how we think. That's very strong philosophy in our bones. And Buddha says that's the way ego works. It's kind of the irony. Mummy didn't teach us this. This is our deep belief already, Buddha says. It's in our bones. So that's the major thing conspiring. Even if you did learn to meditate and did learn to start to notice your mind and go, oh, wow, there's the anger or there's the jealousy. Yeah, I'm jealous, but guess why? Look at David, look at all the other girls. Yes, I'm feeling happy. Why? Because David's so kind to me. So we dump the responsibility. That means we don't take accountability. We don't own what's inside us. And then if we hear that we should, then we feel guilty. Oh, you mean I'm the blame, am I? I see. We have all these heavy views about it. But it's a practical issue. Buddha says, of course, if you can get David to behave nicely, if you can change the light from red to green, go for it, baby. Nothing wrong with that. But what if you can't? That's when this kicks in. You see, that's why for me it has been such a powerful experience working with people in prison. It was back when I first came to... America, California, when the centre was in Venerable Carol's house in Noe Valley, wasn't it? Remember? I had to come here. I was loving in Santa Cruz. I'd drive down every Tuesday or Thursday or two Thursdays. I forget now. So then about that time when I was based up in Land of Medicine Buddha, when, when I was working for um, Mandela Magazine, the magazine of our organisation, and I got a letter from a young man in prison. And then within a year, there are 40 people writing. And what it was a powerful experience for me, dealing with people in prison who wrote and wanted books and wanted to use the Buddhist approach, was they don't have the luxury to change the external world. We still have that. We could leave a job and we could even leave the husband. But sometimes, it, and whereas they don't have the luxury, so they've got no choice. Their backs are against the wall. And they really, the ones that we know over the years who've developed their practice, who've developed the Buddhist practice, who've liked it, they eat it up because they know they can't get a key and walk out the door. They can't even choose their roommates, you know. They don't have a choice. They, they have to change their mind. There's always an amazing example I use. I didn't know this woman, but she's quite well known these days. She's out of prison now. But 40 years ago, in the hippies, she was a hippie in the 70s. This white woman with a white husband and hippie kids, three kids or something, I saw her memoir briefly and I've read about her. I always quote this story. She um, was accused with her husband. They were hitching in Florida and they got picked up by two guys. I don't remember the exact story. I think I'm telling it wrongly, but it's something like this. And, that, and then they were stopped by the coppers and the, the two guys killed the police and blamed the hippies. Well, basically this woman and her husband were blamed for murdering two policemen. So they're on death row and he's even executed. Can you imagine this? Think about this. Think about this. Think about it. He was executed. And then she finally was found innocent when she was tw at 12 years. It took another five years to get out. So she got out after 17 years. But at some point, you can imagine, she lost the children. Then her mother and father died in a car accident. So she lost the children completely into the system. They were, and they were accused of murdering two people. Can we think, now think of yourself when you're accused of doing something you didn't do. Look at the pain. And we often can't ever let go of it. Since we're 10, we're still pain about it, you know. Can you imagine this nightmare? But this woman, she did yoga and things. I don't think she was a Buddhist. I'm not sure. don't think so. But she's such a stark example of what the Buddha is actually, is the essence of Buddhist practice. 
She said, at some point, I realized I couldn't change anything. But they couldn't take my mind from me. So I decided I'm not a prisoner. I'm a monk. I'm not in a cell. I'm in a cave. I mean, that is beyond mind-boggling, isn't it? The courage to be able to think that. We love to hear these people. We love to hear these examples. But this is exactly the point that Buddha's making. But he says, don't wait till, you, until nightmares happen. You can learn to work on your, your car before the wheels fall off. And that's the real point. Because he's saying, you see, because we don't pay attention to here and because we're so taking for granted that life goes up and down and bad things happen, you get upset and frustrated and, you know, but we wait till it's serious. Like you don't go to your therapist because you feel upset. Well, I got guilty today and, you, or, or, you know, I felt a bit annoyed today. Shut up, Rabina, and go home. We wait till we go to the therapist when you want to kill somebody. That's the wheels falling off and that's our big mistake. So can you imagine if in our life we learn to become familiar with our mind, not just notice what's there, but then using the Buddha's skills to actually change what's there. And the simple reason why, the answer to why, is because guess what Buddha says? It's the anger itself, the jealousy, the fears, the drama, the low self-esteem, the guilt, the depression. They themselves are the source of the pain. This is really hard to hear. I'm convinced David is a source of my pain. And I'm convinced David is a source of my happiness. This is very deep in our bones. Now that woman, indeed, it must have been unbearable suffering. But she had the, and I would call it unbelievable intelligence, unbelievable courage to recognize she could change the way she interpreted her experience. And what's and the point is this, why would you want to do that? Because as the Buddha points out, it's your interpretation of the experience that is the source of your happiness or suffering. That basically, and this is where we're getting a bit deeper here, that all these emotions as we call them, like anxiety and anger and jealousy, that's the emotional component. But when we start to become familiar with our mind at a deeper level, what, what Buddha is saying is they're all driven, these emotions are just the expression of these conceptual stories raging on in our head. And we can learn to deconstruct those stories. Buddha, in a sense, is a cognitive therapist. And I'm not kidding, you know. But this is very primordial. These stories are very primordial in us. So if we never pay attention to them and we repeat them all the time and nothing goes astray in our mind... As Lama Zopa says, the particular Buddhist approach, the particular approach in Buddhism about the mind is that everything we ever experience, even if we're not conscious of it, it all gets stored. It all gets stored in the mind. And Buddha's not describing the brain here. So everything gets tucked away in there. So if we don't deal with things as they happen, then it builds up. It's got to come out somewhere, you know. So becoming familiar, not with the external. We spend our lives doing that but with what's happening in here. And this is really what takes time. It really is what takes time, but it's possible. And then we can begin to then hear these conceptual stories and learn to, that's the, that's the wheels wobbling before they fall off, before it becomes emotional. And then you can do the work and change it. So if you can handle that little problem, let's say, you know, you get annoyed with your sister on the telephone. And then you start getting on about it. And you tell your husband tonight and you talk about it again tomorrow. Before you know it, you want to kill your sister. Whereas if you deal with it right there, we know this is obvious, and you deal with it right there after the phone call, oh, give it a break, Ramina, relax about it, she's fine, she just probably had a, you know, got a headache or something, give her a break, let it be, and you learn to change the story. That's a simple, simple example. Then you don't carry it with you. That's the point. So this stuff builds up, you know, and either we, you know, it builds up basically, and it's got to come out somewhere. But we, we are very passive about what goes on in here. We wait till it becomes unbearable. But this is a much more proactive approach. But it demands a lot of rigor, a lot of discipline, and a lot of, in, a lot of courage. Because the things that do happen to us out there, forget about being accused of murdering two policemen, and you didn't. Just little things, we know how painful it is. So it's easy to feel like a victim. It's easy to feel like, well, it's not my fault. I'm allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to be jealous. Look what they did to me. That is a nightmare, Buddha says. That's not going to help you. You might be right. The person was wrong. But that's not the issue. You've got to have this courage. And so the simple point about this, it's not moralistic. It's practical. That woman, in the end, didn't lose the plot, didn't go crazy, and even found a way to find happiness. And this gets us to the point, if we think about the simple word called happiness, as mentioned before. This is a very simple point for the Buddha. It almost seems too simple for us. 
In general, Buddha's saying, I've got to become more specific about this, but in general what Buddha's saying is, all those unhappy neurotic states of mind, which he says we can learn to get rid of, which means they're not at the core of our being, we're not stuck with them. They're very ancient, they're very habitual, they're very convincing. They, it's the presence of those in our mind that is the source of the pain. I think we can prove this. Check the last time you were depressed, anxious, angry. It was completely awful. It was painful. You can't say it's not. But we're so convinced about how a person caused it, I'm allowed to think it. That's kind of insanity. When we understand the pain of it right there. And that's why the woman was so amazing. She could change her view of prison. And then check the last time you were kind, compassionate, generous. Your mind was happy. So the Buddha view is quite literal, that happiness, first and foremost, is, is in the mind, starts with the mind. And even just speaking very simply, if we look at the second lot of states of mind, the Buddha would refer to those as useful, beneficial, valid, virtuous, whatever words you like, not being religious. They have the character of being peaceful and connected to others and therefore called happy. The, 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 the anger and fears and jealousy and depression are constricted and are panic-stricken and are utterly miserable. That's what suffering is. That doesn't mean we can't have physical suffering as well. Yes, we do. But it, it comes down to the, what goes on in our mind. And Buddha's expertise is to become intimately familiar with this, using, of course, his model of the mind, which is not the way we necessarily think in our world. So the thing is to hear it is not as religious, not as moralistic, but it's practical. If you want to be happy, Buddha says, it's up to you, babe. You can change your mind. doesn't mean the outside world doesn't play a role. It doesn't mean that David is right if he punches me. It's not right. It's completely correct. It's not right. It doesn't mean that woman, those people who put her in prison weren't wrong. They were wrong. But she had the amazing ability, which is exactly what Buddha is saying we can do. And that's why extreme examples are so powerful. They're the proof of the pudding, you know. Then the Buddha is saying we can learn to be happy, we can learn to be in control, we can learn to be in charge of our lives, and then when dramas do happen, we won't go berserk, we won't lose the plot, you know. We can, we'll learn to navigate them, we'll be brave enough in the face of things going wrong. But why wait till the wheels are falling off to do this? It's too difficult. Start beforehand. That's why, you see, one of the many, there are many misconceptions, I'd suggest, in our culture about what meditation is. Very, generally speaking, the world, when we think of meditation, we're usually referring to what Buddhism, what the world refers to as mindfulness, which is a general term given to be more specific to this single-pointed concentration technique. And there are, I would suggest there are quite a few misconceptions about it. Well, you know, it, it's okay. I mean, Buddha doesn't own this stuff. But if you say, I'm doing Buddhist meditation and it's called mindfulness, and then you make up your own story, that's kind of rude, you know? Call it your mindfulness, not Buddha's. So the Buddhist approach... One of the misconceptions about mindfulness being a Buddhist technique is we think it's an, we think one of the misconceptions is we think it's a relaxation technique. There are wonderful relaxation techniques, and we need relaxing. We're all crazy, you know. There's definite, but this in its in the single point of concentration is absolutely not a, a a relaxation technique. Complete mistake. We definitely think it's an alternative to a pill, which means you only do it when the wheels fall off. Mistake. We think it's to make all the thoughts go away. Mistake. We think it's to get some kind of nice feeling, mistake. These are all misconceptions. They're fantasies. So you'd be disappointed. Like one person said, oh, I tried meditating yesterday. It didn't work. <laughs> I mean, I tried to understand E equals MC squared yesterday. I couldn't get it. A bit more perseverance, please. So, okay, let's look a bit deeper and analyse a little bit using the Buddhist model the unhappy states of mind, the neurotic ones, the ridiculous ones, the ones he says we can get rid of, the ones that he says are the source of our pain. Because if we're attempting to identify them, we better know what he, what his analysis of them. Because it's quite specific, you know, they're quite specific. And that mean implies we need to know that you have an analysis of what the positive states of mind are. Well, in the Buddhist model of the mind, 
which describes the contents of our mental consciousness, all these thoughts and feelings and emotions, we can divide all of them, and there are thousands, into three categories. There's no fourth category. There are those that we've already implied that are ridiculous, neurotic, eye-based, fear-based, ego-based, if you like, and the source of misery and the cause of why we do dumb things to others. Look at the world. And then second, there are these positive or beneficial or useful or virtuous or, or, or positive, positive states of mind that, are, are, um, that we can develop to perfection, that Buddha says are at the core of our being. This is the major distinction. These thousands of thoughts. I mean, I think even in Buddhist, in Western psychology, I've heard people say there's like a thousand thoughts a second. Buddha agrees with that. My goodness. But then interestingly, you've got a third category. And I like, I like to call them the mechanics of the mind. Things like concentration, intention, attention, vigilance. There's lots of these and they're very specifically defined. And these states of mind, whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you need them to do a good job. So they're neither good or bad in this virtuous sense. So mindfulness is one of these, actually. So speaking very simply, mindfulness is an, an I mean, Lama Yeshi would often refer to as good memory. But all mindfulness is, in the simple sense of being one of the mechanics of our mind and an utterly necessary one, is it's the ability to not forget what you're doing moment by moment. So to make a cake, you need that. To be a sniper, you need that. As Lama Zopa says, thieves need mindfulness. But we hear it a bit, we sort of have lots of bells and whistles on it and think it as something kind of religious. No, it's, it's a part of this third category that we need to cultivate these and these parts of our mind, the Buddhist understanding on them is very specific. We're not discussing the brain, remember. These are developed in single point of concentration. So we get incredible concentration, incredible mindfulness, incredible clarity, incredible attention, incredible intention. Very, I mean, not that one, but very clear. So these are, this is a really interesting way they see the mind. There's the neurotic, ridiculous, deluded ones. There are the positive, valid, virtuous ones. And then these, these mechanics of the mind that we must develop that everybody needs. So in that sense, they're neither negative nor positive. They're neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. So these are very specific type of um, names or labels in Buddhist psychology. So that makes us a bit nervous in the West because we think it sounds like you're judging, you know. So let's look at these. Let's look at them and why they call – look at the negative ones – and why they cause us suffering. Well, the Buddha's got a, there's a when you read the literature, you hear that he talk, the Buddha talks about 84,000, we've got 84,000 different problems. So in a way, you could say they've got this massive map of the mind, you know, and it divides into 84,000 different um, neurotic states of mind, 84,000 pro, 84, problems. But luckily, he narrows it down to three. And I tell you, if we can understand these three, we have a deep understanding of Buddhist psychology and we have a deep understanding of our own mind and therefore we can have a deep understanding of somebody else's mind because all the other dramas come out of these. All, there's a very intricate kind of map of all these states of mind. And by the way, this information doesn't come from using microscopes to look at your brain. This comes from these genius Indians before the Buddha, these great yogis, who through getting single point of concentration, which is like accessing the microscope of your mind, they've unpacked and unraveled and identified and mapped the internal process. We don't talk like this in our culture. It's very fascinating. So what are the character, what are the characteristics of these unhappy ones? Or what, let's, 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 okay, what are these three? Because all those 84,000 subsume to the three. Ling Rinpoche just recently, has he been here yet? I know in, in London when I was there, he, he mentioned, I'd never heard this before, he said, he said, 21,000 are related to ignorance, 21,000 are related to attachment, 21,000 are related to, to anger, and the other 21,000 are related to all of them. I'd never heard that before. Have you heard that before? Isn't that fascinating? First time I heard it. I thought it was really, really eye-opener, isn't it? So don't worry about the 84,000. Let's look at three. And this is already kind of interesting. So what's the, th these words we're going to know well. You'll hear them. They're just regular English words. But these are the terms for these three neurotic states of mind that the Buddha says are the source of all the other rubbish and the source of our pain and the source of why we make a mess of our lives and the source of all the suffering on the planet and look at the world and we can get rid of them. They're not at the core of our being. So what are these three? Well, the simple words for them, the first one's called ignorance, the second is called attachment and the third is called anger. Like, oh, how disappointing, how boring, you know. But let's unpack them because they're very fascinating. 
And they have an intimate relationship. They've got a, they've got like a hierarchical relationship. So ignorance is is okay. The word they use in um, in Sanskrit for all these problems is one word they use is called klesha, and the, the the English translation of it is the word affliction, which is a very nice word. But I think we just have, we just happen to use it, do we? It's a bit old fashioned. You don't say, "Oh, I have an affliction." <laughs> you have a problem. <laughs> you have a problem. You know. And it's either, it's either or an illness or a, a, a problem. And it's either a mental problem or a physical one, isn't it? <coughs> so anger is a mental problem. And knee aches is a physical problem, an affliction. Well, as some of the lamas, like Geshe Sopa would say, he always says when he says the word affliction, he makes sure you know it's a mental affliction because it's the mind. Anger is the mind. Jealousy is the mind. Ignorance is the mind. So it's a mental affliction. Well, you know, I like to think of another word for the word affliction and it's called, it's the word illness. Well, guess what? Anger is a mental illness. Ignorance is a mental illness. And that's a very shocking statement in our culture. That's like shocking to hear because we have such a vivid, don't we, a vivid meaning to that term. And usually a person we call mentally ill is way down the end spectrum of the problems. So we're normal and then there's a, a wacko person, you know, and that's mental illness. And it's a very heavy label in our minds, isn't it? Very heavy to be labelled mentally ill is like shocking. It's like being called a criminal. But that's the meaning that Buddha's giving to this word affliction. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. And it's shocking to hear, but let's try and understand what that means. So ignorance, what's its function? This is the deepest one. This is really hard to identify really subtle, deeply, deeply primordial within us. And the best way to talk about one of the main functions of all of these afflictions, all of these mental problems, there's two main functions, okay? We'll go into individual detail, but there's two main functions. 11.30, we're supposed to have a break soon, aren't we? We're okay? We started late, so we'll... Okay. <laughs> So uh, maybe I'll stop first before I start going to details. And I'll ask you if, if you have any questions. Then we can have a little break. So do you have any, from what I've said so far, and I'll go to details later if we have time. Do you have any questions now for me? Any old question at all? Start the ball rolling. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have, I have a question. So I I remember that from uh, one of the teaching, and I'm not sure who gave the teaching. Maybe it was the Dalai Lama. He yes. said that that anger is is almost impossible to prevent from arising. Meaning that when someone does something negative to you, when someone what? No, when someone does something negative to you, yes. it's almost impossible to prevent anger from arising. Yes. It's like a very sharp pike. I understand. Yeah. So let's go on, uh, because I haven't gone into detail yet. We need to wait until we look at what that is exactly and its relationship to the others before we can answer that question. So can you wait a little bit? Okay. Okay, thanks. Someone else? Where? Someone, any old question? If you have any, go. Any questions? Yes. Mary Ellen, go. I just wanted to ask you to repeat the breakdown that Ling Rinpoche did. The 84,000. Yeah. 21,000 are directly related to ignorance, 21,000 related to anger, and 21,000 to attachment, and the other 21,000 to all three. Okay? Any more questions? Well, I have to keep talking or we have a break, one or the other. Yes, go, go. Well, maybe what I can do, ask your question, go. Yes, sweetheart. Yes. So um, I, I sometimes I have conversations with my friends who are not familiar with Buddhist text. Yes. And I tell them that the, one of the ways that, that uh, Buddhists do is to actually deal with our own anger. One attachment. of the ways what? One of our main practice is to deal with our anger and try to get rid of anger. To do what? To, get, to be aware of our anger and get rid of our anger. Yes, right. Well, that's so, what we're talking here, isn't it? Like yes. we're discussing. Yes. So yes. Then? yes. And so he said that um, it's very nice, but one of our 
uh, the way that our political system mobilized is yes. through anger. Basically, people get together, people have to protest, people have to go I understand. To, to vote. Again, I can't answer that until I discuss what anger is according to Buddha. So let's, we're going to have to do that. So both your questions can be answered when we go into some detail, a little bit of detail about these states of mind. But maybe it's a good time to have the break. You know, when we have a break, yes. a short break for people to get you know, tea and a snack. Good. And then... And then have a discussion. Then and and while you're doing that, see if there's any questions can pop up. It's a good idea. Okay. See you soon. Fifteen minutes. So now let's go a bit more detail into these states of mind. And then, what's your name? Who asked the question about anger? Min. Who? Min. Then we can ask some Min's questions. Okay. So these three are simply called ignorance, attachment, and anger. So the thing is they've got this very intimate relationship with each other. This is the way the Buddhist approach talks about the mind. And this is not how we necessarily think at all. Well, first of all, ignorance, that sounds like a weird one, doesn't it? What do you mean ignorance, you know? We think of some dumb person. But it's a very, like all these terms have got very specific definitions. And this ignorance, um, it's very roughly speaking, it's uh, this deeply instinctive, ridiculous, fear-based neurotic, concrete view deep in our bones, um, a sense of a concrete, solid, limited me. It's a simple way of putting it. It's deep in our bones. We don't articulate it. We don't teach this in modern psychology. It's the, it's, and, uh, so one of the key functions, I'm about, I said before, one of the key functions of all these neuroses is that they're kind of, there's two things. The one is they're disturbing, and that's very evident. We all proved, we already proved. But the other key thing, and I wanted to go into this, and this is very curious, is they all kind of like, their conceptual stories deep in our bones, but they're liars, they're misconceptions, they're made up stories, they're inaccurate, they're not valid. And that sounds very abstract to us to think about how anger is not valid. It sounds peculiar, how it's a lie. But we're going to go into this. This is the crucial point. So this ignorance is the deepest of these lies, the deepest misconception, the most primordial. And it's very tasty when it's often, when, it, when we relate to our own self, it's referred to as ego grasping or self grasping. And it's like, mostly like a sleeping lion. So it's only when we get very offended or insulted or upset when bad things happen, that's when it kind of rises up. And its flavor is nature, is fear and panic and misery, you know. So on the basis of this deepest misconception, this deepest delusion, this deepest disturbing emotion, it then its main voice is attachment. This simple, simple word. But it's got such a clear definition in Buddhism and it's not the way we use the word at all. We've really got to be clear when we hear this word attachment, what we think of attachment, and that's fine, we can have different definitions, we know that, many words have different definitions. So when we say attachment, we think it as a good quality. We say, oh, she's very attached to her family. Nothing wrong with that, but Buddha's definition is not that. It's not as if he thinks that definite, it's not as if he has, he thinks de attachment is one thing. Like we know different words have different definitions, don't we? We know that. So we need to know that Buddha's got another definition altogether. What he's referring to is the main voice of this ego grasping, which is this, first of all, it's, it's multifaceted. The deepest level of it, it's like a feel, a deepest feeling, and we're born with it, a deepest feeling of dissatisfaction. I haven't got enough. I'm not enough. I am not enough. No matter what I get, not enough. How much I achieve, not enough. How much David tells me he loves me, not enough. It's never enough. It's deep, deep, deep dissatisfaction. And we can see all of us to one degree or another have this. Absolutely. Some have it much more chronically you know dissatisfaction is like the energy of attachment so the next level of it this attachment is naturally because you're dissatisfied you don't think you've got enough you have to hanker after something don't you it's obvious and that's where all the sense objects come in via our senses we're always looking out there for something person event whatever such that when we get contact with it it triggers happy feelings and we kind of believe it'll bring satisfaction. It'll take the pain away. It'll fill up the gaping hole. The next level of attachment based on this, and all this is happening so primordially in the depth of our being, it's at the level of assumptions. That's why we have to go deep into our minds to identify it. 
It's just, it's just at the level of feeling as far as we're concerned. The next level of it is then naturally you manipulate to get that. So if, if I'm looking for the boy, I'm searching out there, then my eyes glom onto David and he fits my definition of what I think is delicious. So I'm going to manipulate to get the fella, aren't I? You know? So that's manipulating, controlling, manipulating. Then you ex- have expectations that, and because already what attachment's doing is it's making up this big fantasy about David. We all know that. The fantasy about the chocolate cake attachment, the key function of it is now, this is where this is kicking in all the way, it exaggerates the deliciousness of the object. It exaggerates the function of that person, that thing, that event, that object to make me happy. So it's deep in our bones. As Lama Yeshi says, I can tell you about attachment for one whole year. You will never begin to understand it until you start going deep inside. And this is the point here, you know. So attachment is all of this. Dissatisfaction, hankering, neediness, emotional hunger really. It manipulates, it controls, it exaggerates and then it possesses. All of this is a function of attachment. We, We recognize each of those components. They're all a function of this one mental illness called attachment. And the Buddha says this is the main source of our suffering in daily life. Now that sounds very shocking to us. That's not how we think of things at all. So now, what's the next one? This is simply called anger. But maybe more simply, the bare bone state of mind is aversion. So attachment, speaking simply, is just this overexcited, when it sees what it wants, goes, oh, that's nice, and you go towards it. Aversion is, oh, no, that's not what I want. Go away. So basically, attachment and aversion, on the basis of this ego grasping, they're the main players in daily life. Attachment is the default. It's this assumption that I'm basically, and it sounds very brutal putting it this way, but if you want to summarize all those qualities, the essence of attachment is this assumption that I must get what I want every millisecond. It's like frantic. It's like panic-stricken. It's like desperate. Another way to put it is because attachment only can bear the nice things. It only wants the nice things. It only wants what I think is nice, like the right cake, the right person, the right thing, the right colour traffic light, the right words from David, the right shape, the right everything. Attachment is this constant, it's a story we've made up. It's got its own particular story. Each one of us has got our own particular story about what the object is that will make me happy. And then attachment gloms onto it, exaggerates it, manipulates to get it and tries to keep it. All on the basis of believing that when I get it, I'll get happy. In the, in, the, in the literature in Buddhism, it's dealt with an incredible depth, this simple process, you know. And this is the main job of being a Buddhist, become in touch with this process. Internal. Internal. So then the point is this. That's the assumption all the way through. So the millisecond it doesn't get what it wants. And that's what makes it sound very brutal. But this is how it works. The millisecond, this frantic assumption that I must get what I want all the time, doesn't get what it wants, and that's a thousand times a day. That's what gives rise to aversion. That is the very arising of aversion. So it too is multifaceted. The gross, obvious, volatile level of aversion is obvious. It's called anger. You shout and yell and have a panic attack. The minute attachment doesn't get what it wants. That's what it is. It sounds very brutal to talk about it this way. Aversion is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. And these are working a thousand, this is working continuously all day under everything. So aversion, the most obvious level is shout and yell, anger. There are milder levels of aversion. And these are simply called atta- or annoyance, irritation, upset, frustrated. We, we have that. We don't go, like I said, you don't go to the therapist, oh, I got frustrated today. Shut up, Rabina. I got raging angry today, then we might go, that's the wheels falling off. But we don't think it matters. Oh, a bit of a frustration, annoyance, irritated. And we go, oh, that's normal, that's normal, that's normal. No, Buddha says it's not normal, it's mental illness. So we've got to start catching this stuff. This is the point before it gets serious. But even more than that, the, the, the anger, irritation, annoyance, frustration, anxiety, panic, worried, they're all, of a, they're all kind of thwarted attachment. We have panic attacks, you know, because things aren't going the way attachment wants. Then it goes into more subtle levels of depression and despair. They're all aversion. They're the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So the obvious levels of it are fairly clear. You can see the evidence. But this is happening at a much subtler level, subtler level. And we've got to keep digging deep, ever more deep, ever more deep, ever more deep. 
into these states of mind. So this is what's this is where too it's quite shocking to us because this is not how we think. What we do in our psychology, and this is okay, we look at the events and the past and the thing out there that call that we think is the source of this frustration, annoyance, irritation, upset, aversion, despair. Buddha says it's fine, but his approach is to look directly at the very states of mind themselves. And this seems to us almost like a puzzle initially. What do you mean, you know? That's why we have to understand his analysis. So when we think of attachment and aversion and, and depression, we think of emotions, feelings. Well, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's when the body's involved. That's when the wheels are falling off. What we have to learn to do, like I said, is become familiar with these, these states of mind that are there all the time, but at subtler levels before they full, become full-blown emotion. That's the tricky part. That's what takes time. Because it's at that level we can deal with the wobbly wheels before we go crazy, you know, and kill ourselves or kill someone else. So, okay, on the basis of this analysis... Anger is this neurotic, delusional, hysterical, eye-based, fear-based state of mind and, se and serious problem. So our trouble is when we see, in our culture, when we say anger, we conflate it with seeing problems, trying to fix them. We conflate it with compassion, and they, but they're different for the Buddha. We have to be much, he's much more precise in what he would suggest, he, what he would point to as the part that's called anger. Are you with me here? What's your name again? Yeah. What's your name again? What's your name again, darling? Oh, Min. Min, Min. Okay, Min. So we have to isolate it. So if we understand it, it's, this, it's, it's emotional, it's distorted, it's neurotic, it's delusional, it's eye-based, it's fear-based. So therefore it's useless. It's not healthy. It disturbs your mind. It makes you miserable, causes you to exaggerate the ugliness of the thing out there, causes you to lose the plot and causes you to harm others. So it's, it's a, an appalling state of mind. But we don't get much fundamentalist about it. So let's look at the other parts that we think are anger, but which Buddha was saying is not anger. I mean, I remember even Martin Luther King, this blew my mind. Martin Luther King said, it is good to be angry. Now, what he meant was it's good to find fault. It's good to say, oh, my God, look at the racism. Look at the suffering. Look at the sexism. Look at the environmentalism. Look at the problems. That's not anger. That's called intelligence. So then you go, this is terrible. And then he said, this is what he said, then you say, what can I do to fix it? How can I help? That's compassion. But we can fight that with anger. We think you need to have raging anger in order to see a problem. No, you need a common sense to see problems. Are you with me here, I Min? Mean. So if we take an example, and this is a really good example to the world, the Dalai Lama. I mean, if you want to take his experiences as a Tibetan, and he's like the father and the mummy and the daddy of all the Tibetans for the last six, you know, of all these years, and the 60 years since he's been out of exile, if you want to take all the things that have happened to his country and his people, he has enough reason in our terms to be out of his brain with rage. You get my point here. You see my point. Anybody with half a brain can see he's a happy guy. So that should blow our minds. Do you see what I'm saying? That it's evident he's not angry. So how come he's, he never stops? But the point is this. When we conflate anger with action, and then we think you can't be angry, we, can, we, we then become, we think we have to become passive. Oh, well, it's okay. Murder me. It's all right. It doesn't matter. I'm not angry. That's not the analysis Buddha uses. Anger is a very specific state of mind that can come along with compassion, but we conflate them, and that's the part where we need a lot of analysis to see the difference. So the key function of all the neuroses, if they're a neurotic state of mind, they're deluded, fear-based, distorted, and they all come down to the neurotic eye. They're all the, the neurotic, deluded view of what I want and what I don't want. But we have love, we have compassion, we have the wish to help. They're virtues. Go for them. Never throw those out. So the Dalai Lama, for 60 years, look at the suffering of his culture. Look at the suffering of his people. The planet is destroyed. You know, the people destroyed. It's taken over by another country, whatever. It's unbearable suffering, you can imagine. And look, but he hasn't given up for 60 years. He has not given up, but he's not angry. He cracks jokes about his torturers. He cracks jokes about these people. But he hasn't lost the plot. He's a funny person. He's kind. He's compassionate. He's wise. But he hasn't given up trying. He doesn't just sit there and accept it. He hasn't given up. And that's the point even about that woman in prison. She didn't get angry. She didn't go crazy. 
I remember another time, at the same time I was reading about her, I read about another guy on death row who was also innocent, but who we think is normal. He completely lost his brain. He was out of his brain with rage, despair, anger. And we think, oh, well, he's normal. She's just kind of weird. We, we analyse that the Dalai Lama's kind of weird. We just think anger is a healthy thing. We think it's necessary. And why we say that is because that's all we know. So we, we, we take what we've got as our given and then we, try and we, we, work, we sort of work a way to fit it in. So this is a very difficult view because the Buddha's one is there's a stuff that's neurotic and causes you suffering and, and you can get rid of them. And then what you're left with is compassion, wisdom, clarity, confidence, kindness, and you never give up. That woman never gave up working on her freedom. She doesn't give, she doesn't give up and become passive. She, she didn't go crazy, so she became happy, but she never stopped working on her freedom and she got it eventually. But that poor guy who lost his brain, all he could do was scream daily apparently, I did not rape and kill that woman. So he could do nothing to help himself and he couldn't find any possibility to do anything. He just went mad. You see what I'm saying? So anger is a specific state of mind that's related directly to attachment. It's thwarted attachment. It's completely neurotic, eye-based. It, and it's destructive to me and it causes me to harm others. But we can see if we, you know, like I know, we can see that we can have, when we see the injustices of the world, that's called intelligence. So that rises something in us and it would become anger. But then we go, but, but as Martin Luther King said, and I think anyone who looks at that fellow, he wasn't angry. He had a very peaceful nature. Do you understand? He had a really peaceful nature. But he, look at the action. He never stopped trying to make the world a better place. That's compassion. That's action. And the fact is, anger just distorts your mind. And then what anger does is make the thing look monstrous. So you become paralyzed. So it's a very particular analysis. Are oh, you see what I'm saying? Does it make sense, I Min? Mean, we've got to really think about it because it's, it's not the way we define these terms at all. It's not the way we think. And even in our culture, I remember just recently one woman had came to one of the teachings and we're discussing this. As she said, and this is really true, when we hear this for the first time, she was shocked. She was so direct. She said, that's insane. That's not a normal person. What do you mean have no anger, jealousy, attachment? I mean, we can't even imagine what you'd be like. You seem kind of like, that would be a weird person. She said, this is weird. And that's really true because it's not our analysis. So it's very shocking, really. So we've got to give it such careful thought. And this is what takes so much time. If we don't pay attention to our own thoughts and feelings and emotions every second, which is the job of being a Buddhist, we're going to be just theoretical about it. We're never going to change one inch. We'll still be neurotic and ridiculous. So it really is the hardest job we'll ever do. So it's learning to distinguish exactly the distinction, the difference between the neurotic thoughts and the happy thoughts. The virtuous thoughts. And the poet is, they're going a thousand thoughts a second and they've got levels and levels. So it's a really in intense job. So that's why in the Buddhist approach, the first entry level junior school grade one, you know, practice is nothing to do with your mind. That's advanced. You know, in the Tibetan tradition, there's a way of packaging all of Buddha's teachings. It, there's a certain packaging. That's like, it's like a course and you end up graduating as a Buddha and all the teachings are, are structured incrementally. And as His Holiness said, it's like the education system. So we know very well you go to school, it's junior school. Then you've got high school, then you've got university, then you have postgraduate. Well, this whole, practice, this whole packaging is like that. So entry-level junior school grade one is not working on your mind. Like we're talking here, working on your mind. This is high school, people. So, what, so the other thing that's, again, massively um, conspiring against us doing this job is that we're out of control body and speech, behavior. Like in my life, anger was what, my, my middle name. So I didn't have to make an effort to get angry. The millisecond I didn't get what I wanted, out it came the mouth. You understand? And I didn't notice it until it came out of the mouth. Oh, I must be angry. Well, you might be the kind of person who doesn't know that what's going on in your mind, just like I didn't, but you're, you have to wait till you're inert in bed and can't get out of bed because you're inert with depression. Oh, I must be depressed. Bit late. So, you know, it's hard to control, especially if it's, if, it's your, if it's a habit. So that's where it takes the first level of practice, Buddha says, don't worry about watching your mind yet. Just control the servants of your mind, which is your body and speech. Look what does the harm on the planet. The mind is the source, but it's the hand and the, and the speech that do the harm and the foot. 
People kick, kill, shoot, torture and slay bad words. That's what harms sentient beings and that for the Buddha is what harms us. So the first entry level junior school grade one level is back off and don't harm sentient beings. So when you can begin to harness your body and speech, when you begin to pay attention to your servants of your mind and harness them, which then implies don't put 17 pieces of cake in your mouth, don't jump on every ball you feel like it, you harness, you grow up and, dis- and become disciplined. You get ethics. Then you've got the luxury to go to high school, get some concentration and now do the real job of working on your mind. Do you understand? So it's incremental, it's gradual. That's why the emphasis, I mean, in Buddhism, is good ethics. It's absolutely necessary, you know. I mean, I can see you from my life. It's always been my problem. My behaviour's been naughty. You know, it's like behaviour sounds peculiar, but behaviour is what you do with your body and speech. And all the vows in Buddhism are only about behaviour, not about the mind. Harnessing our behaviour, because that's what impacts upon others. So I remember as a kid, I was, I was so difficult. And as an adult, and I'm nearly dead now, I'm still difficult. You know, your behaviour's crazy. I remember one time I was moaning to Lama Yeshi. I was feeling all this self-pity about my pathetic self, you know, how we get self-piteous. And he was so kind and it just blew my mind. He said, there's nothing wrong with your heart, dear. It's just your behaviour. <laughs> so that was really helpful for my mind. It was incredible because, you know, when you, when you kind of do naughty things, you think, oh, I'm bad, you know. He said, no, you're fine. It's just your behaviour. It was like a miracle to hear it. You know, I was still trying to behave nicely. Do you understand? But it's a very powerful approach. And it seems not kind of boring. Oh, I want to be a Buddhist. I want to meditate. Well, forget meditating. Control your speech first. I mean, you think about it. It's logical. If you shoot your mouth up every second, you feel bad things. If you shout and yell at people, if you jump on every girl you feel like it, eat every piece of cake you feel, how have you got any space at all to see what drives that behavior, which is your mind, which is attachment and aversion? Forget it, baby. Forget it. So it's really... Takes time, you know. Takes time. Are we communicating, Min? So we've got to think of this carefully, you know. And what happens is we can misunderstand this approach. We get a very superficial understanding. Oh, I've, got to not, I've got to not be angry. I've got to give up attachment. We become kind of like nihilistic. We're kind of kind of this boring person. Oh, would you like some tea, Rabina? Oh, no, I'm, a, I'm detached. <laughs> would like some sugar? No, I, I don't mind. That, that means not – that's kind of horrible. That's a really gross misunderstanding of Buddhist approach. It's way more nuanced than that, you know. And that's why the Dalai Lama for me is a great example because we have this cliched view that if you're a nice Buddhist, you walk slowly and talk slowly and eat slowly if you do anything at all. I mean, it's not like you're grounding to a halt, you know, grinding to a halt. It's nihilism. So that's why the Dalai Lama for me, is for us in our culture, is a great example. He stalks fast, he walks fast, he's funny, he seems volatile. I mean, phew, you know, you think, wow, you can be a normal person, you can be like him as well. So you don't chuck the baby out of the bathwater. But because we have a very different analysis of attachment and anger and we, we, you see, we give equal status to these things as if they're a normal part of a normal person. So normal that we think you'd be abnormal if you didn't have them. So it really takes time to hear this stuff. And then to begin to first know theoretically these states of mind by studying Buddhist psychology, which most Buddhists don't do, you know, and then through practice, identifying them in your mind, you know. Are we communicating, people? Now ask me some questions. Come on, before we finish. It's already late, 10 past 12. We'll just have 10 minutes of questions and then we can finish. At least I have to finish anyway. Yes, go. Uh, Myron, talk to me. Attachment, I can understand attachment, but I don't... Speak close to the mic. Thanks, Myron. I understand attachment Yes. in different views like taught attachment culturally and self-evident attachment like feeling good health no that's not attachment no no myron i think you've got a wrong definition of attachment attachment is neurotic needy eye-based obsessive exaggerates manipulates controls and possesses that is not what you said Um, excuse me it's more specific than that actually it is what i said oh i beg your pardon (laughs) okay Go on. But uh, I don't understand primal attachment. Whose term is that? I don't know that word. I thought you... I sort of talked about... I just sort of meant, speaking loosely, what I meant was very deep, primordially, instinctively deep, way beyond volition, because it's a, habit, a deeply ingrained habit that the Buddha says we come, that we bring with us from before. We can only get to see that level when we've got Singapore to concentration, Myron. 
We've got super sharp mind. We can go very deep into our mind. Okay, but that yes. that can be made invisible to my consciousness. When you've got when we've got very when we've got concentration, when we can look into our minds much more deeply. Okay. Yes, of course. That's why we have to have single point of concentration to really do the job that Buddha says we can do in the long term. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Bye. We've got to start where we are at the grossest level, then we go deeper. We un- keep un- sort of like layers of onions. You keep s- rip stripping away the layers, seeing it ever more subtle, ever more subtle, ever more subtle. Do you understand? I do. I Good. always considered primordial inaccessible, but apparently. No, it's not in. Inex- nothing's inaccessible for the Buddha. Everything that exists is knowable for the Buddha. But every one of us. Okay. That's what he says. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Who else? Someone else. Any old question. Any old question. Doesn't matter. Any old question. Yes. I mean. Can I ask another question? Mm. <laughs> Go, babe. Okay. So, um, I, based on your experience with uh, interacting with scientists and uh, psychologists, what's the relationship between? Buddhism and modern uh, psychotherapy, for example. Oh, I can't answer that so easily. I don't have an. I don't. I can't possibly say that because I think there's a thousand different views in the West, aren't there? Where's David? Is he here? So there's a thousand different models, aren't there, of the mind? You can't even pin it down to even a simple answer. Each person. I think that's where we're interesting with psychology. We we sort of every day we're, we're, we're you know creating new ideas about it. So I can't possibly answer that question. But I might be able to say maybe one thing that maybe is fairly evident. That's not to be insulting to anybody, because the general modern the the materialist the philosophical materialist views, which are you know are either neuroscience, which informs psychology, are by default describing brain. So that's why when you have single point of concentration, and it's that's where you access a subtler level of your consciousness that this materialist model doesn't posit as existing. So it's at a subtler level where I think you then got the, ma- the radical differences. Wouldn't you agree there? But there's a, there are these discussions now though, aren't there? More and more. I remember one time I, when I was working on a book of Lama Zopas about how to help at the time of death, and the Buddhists go on about death a lot and have very detailed descriptions of the process. I remember reading at the time a book by this wonderful medical, medical journalist, he was very funny, Dick or Nick Teresi, it was called The Undead. It's not about zombies, but it's all the conflicts and problems and obstacles and contradictions that are coming now in the medical profession, particularly in this country, because that was his expertise, about exactly when death happens. And this is marvellous because they're now discovering, I mean, he had a whole chapter on out-of-body experiences because he's just reporting them. He's, and all the time of, like, as partic- I'll give one example. In particular, um, there was one, when, you know, when you give organs, when you stop breathing, that's when we call death. Well, for the Buddhist view, it's very clear you're not dead yet. Your subtle consciousness is still there, but there's no gross, ev- there's no physical evidence of it because it doesn't depend upon the brain. So you look like you're dead, but you're not. So, but they keep you breathing, don't they? I'm not being rude here. They keep you breathing, and then they pop you on the on the gurney in the operating theatre, and now they get. And so this one woman was reported. The nurse who was monitoring the heartbeat of this woman who was going to have her organs cut out, she reported that when they got the circular saw and began to cut her from head to toe, she observed that her heartbeat went from 100 to 200 beats a minute. And as the author said, I wonder what a dead person has to be anxious about. So what I'm just speaking simply here, the Buddha's view, you know, he had, see, you know how we, when we have dreams, that's subtle. Buddhism would call dreams subtle consciousness, okay? You got your subtle consciousness. That's what happens when you die in this Buddhist analysis. When the gross level has stopped, your senses, you now your subtle consciousness is there, but there's no evidence of it. So that's where people leave their, have the experiences of leaving their body, of all that she had, a whole chapter of people who reported being out of their body, watching their body being operated on during their operations. That's your subtle consciousness. So that can be exactly the same when you're dead. Your subtle consciousness is still in your body, but it has the capacity to cognize what's going on. So she would, that, I can deduce that that woman whose heartbeat went from 100 to 200 beats. Her mind is still in her body, but she's, still, she's observing what's going on. She's thinking, God, I'm not dead yet, and they're going to cut my organs out. So of course her heart would go to 200 beats a minute. So it's a tricky business. It's a tricky thing. But one, I remember one doctor quoted in this book. He said, I can say now with certainty that consciousness is not a function of the brain. I don't know what it is, but that much I can say. So I think all these discussions are really bringing this up, and this is fantastic, you know. This is great. What else, people? Questions? Question. Go, go, go. Somebody that has Alzheimer's, because my mother had Alzheimer's yes. and got worse and worse and for years. Yes. But when she died, yes. her brain was shot. But So you're saying... Okay. Yeah. The Buddha's view, just say it again, the Buddha's view 
is that we have we have a brain, but we have a consciousness. So you know how Christians would say you have a brain, but you have a soul. And we, we, if you're a Christian, you know there's two things, isn't it? Do you agree? Do you agree? The Buddhists, you they don't use the word soul, but they would they use the word consciousness or mind. But it refers to the grosser level of your of your intellect, emotions, anger, love, compassion, jealousy, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, the entire spectrum, and. Whereas the Christians would say your soul is not physical, Buddha says all of your consciousness is not physical. So at the grosser level, we of course we have a brain. So I would put it this way, a simple way to put it, that what goes on in our brain is a physical indicator of what's happening in our mind. So the Buddha would very clearly say that consciousness isn't itself physical, but it's connected to the brain. That's the way to put it. So when your brain is fried, like your darling mummy, everything came out crooked for your mummy, didn't it? She'd lost. So she, you know, if you look at the third quality, the third characteristic of states of mind that I mentioned before, she, you know, we have intention, we have attention, concentration, good memory. Well, those were gone. She lost the plot. You know that those parts of your mind her brain might have looked fine but so that was the gross part of her consciousness but her consciousness has got these subtle levels so when she stopped breathing that was there and then that would leave the body buddha says and then it goes to another body that's the whole business of reincarnation so it's a very different type of analysis you see what i'm saying but the other thing is this you we know if your brain is fried or you or you've got a stroke you, you, your thoughts maybe is, are crystal clear but they all come out yucky because the physical is like a mess, you know. So we think, oh, the poor person's insane. But they're not. Their mind is crystal. Their thoughts are crystal clear. But the brain is all wrong. Something's kind of weird. Some people also, their thoughts can be confused too. But sometimes it's just the body, you know. Do you understand? What else, people, before we finish? Anything else? Was that enough food for thought? Huh? What do you think? Yes, here. Thank you, darling. So I think sometimes in the Buddhist path, like it's easy to get discouraged. You know, it's like you see your uh, anger or attachment again, and again, That's trying right. to apply it to, uh, antidotes, but it seems like it's not working. That's right. It feels like you're not really making progress. I understand. Yes. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's very easy. Keep the mic. Keep the mic. <laughs> it's really simple. It's like you've decided, you've seen the television, you've seen the Dalai Lama, oh, I'd like to be like him. You've seen Federer, it's like that, you want to become like him. But what you, you've got to, what the mistake is, isn't that after practice that you're good as Federer, it's you've got the wrong expectation of how quick you should be like Federer. That's the mistake. So it's a, a false expectation that sh you should be better than you are. When you change that, you'll accept and you'll move forward and be delighted with your progress. That's as simple as that, baby. But the irony is, you see, that the function of attachment is always to be dissatisfied. So before we were dissatisfied with the boyfriend, with the fridge and the house, and now we think, oh, I better become a Buddhist. So now we become dissatisfied with our progress. So you can't win. It's still attachment playing. You understand? So we've got to learn to be satisfied. That sounds very weird. But, and again, a good analogy for me is, you know, like if, you, if, you, if you're going to learn to be a doctor or something, you know it's several years of study. Or you're going to school, it's several years of study. So what happens is we go, oh, I'm aiming for grade 22, you know, and you get to grade one, oh, I'm only in grade one. <laughs> then you get to grade two, oh, I'm only in grade two. Well, you get to grade 490, you'll still be dissatisfied. So how about practicing being happy with grade one and then eager to get to the next stage? See, contentment doesn't mean sitting back on your laurels. Contentment is I've done so well so far, let's go to the next level. It's, that's the attitude, sweetheart, and if we can have that, everything changes. But you've got to really practice it. You with me? Yep. People say, oh, I've been practicing for 30 years, I'm still angry. Yes, that's exactly right. That shows how deep it is. But look at your progress. And the other one is this, which we never think about. Because we're such junkies for good feelings now, that's a bit the another analogy here is like your garden. You know very well if you're sowing an, uh, an acorn, you, got to, you might not even be there in your lifetime. You, got, you can't expect the tree to come. But you are happy every time you go to that garden. You see this little baby thing sprouting up, you nourish it, and you, you know it'll be there in a long time. So you, you, you enjoy the steps. I can't stress that enough. I cannot stress that enough. Because what you're doing is you're sowing seeds, sweetheart, and it's long term. So that's a very different view and we have to get that. So, so, And again, the point is this, you don't judge how well you did in your garden today by how well you feel. Oh, I felt so happy today, I did some gardening. And then you, as if somehow when you're feeling miserable, you didn't do any gardening. No, you're doing just as much working on your mind every day just because you feel bad is not the criterion of success. That's a junkie. Just, 
attachment just wants to have happy feelings all the time. It's like a little child, you know. Do you understand? So when you go to the gym, you think I'm going to get fit. You come home the first day with muscles you didn't know you had. You've got such pain you couldn't believe it, but you know it's a good pain. That's the attitude we have to develop. I really mean this. Yes, go. So um, kind of following with one of your last comment, you, know, you don't judge your progress or your worth by how you feel on that day. And yeah. you don't judge your self-worth with how others tell, say Absolutely. about you Absolutely. That's right, darling. But sometimes then, because that's, that's the, the mental pattern that's been happening so long. That's exactly it's right. It's kind of like, how, what do I replace with? You replace it with your wisdom. You assess yourself. You, use, you, you know, it's like, how do you judge if you're playing the piano right? You look up with your eyes at the piano on your piano and you look at Bach's instructions. So here we're using Buddha's. You don't have to use Buddha's view. You, don't, you can use Jung if you like, but if you're going to use Buddha's view, it's very specific. All the, all, the, all, the, all the notes are there on the piece of paper. So you assess yourself according to that. That's, then, you, then you know where you're going. It's not just kind of how you feel. That's very childish. Do you understand? Good. Yes. Hamida. Um, I'm really trying to keep um, my mouth shut and my hands to myself. Keep, zip your lip and keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. Right. Love it. I, I'm really trying Good. to work on this one. But what happens when I work with young people and sometimes they say, Hamida, I have a problem. I want to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, come on, tell me. And then they tell me, oh, this happened at home. That's right. And then I'm like, in my head, I'm like, uh, keep your mouth shut and your hands to yourself. But then I'm like, oh, but they're asking me for advice. Right. And then I'm thinking about all of your teachings and I'm like, I might y use the, the, the metaphor of loving your problem like you love ice cream. And then they say to me, what? Where, where'd you get this from? I mean, that's too advanced, Hamida. Don't you, that's a very advanced practice. I know, yeah. They love ice cream and I'm like, oh, that could be a really good one. I know, but it's my, too advanced. My question is, yeah. how do I... What's your advice? How do you know how to answer? Exactly. Thank you, should Hamid. I, it's a very I simple answer. I always have to use analogies, and then we get it. If you, if if if, if you, if you, if someone comes to you with a question about nutrition, you can't answer if you don't know nutrition, do you? So, if a person comes and asks about their mind and their problems, if to the extent that you've done any work in yourself, is only the extent to which you can help them. So all it is, if you don't know how to answer them, then you have to do more work in yourself and get to know. So meanwhile, keep it simple and love them, give them a hug and tell them it's okay, you're doing great. That's very pretty powerful, I tell you. Don't try to be too clever with it. But that's why the wisdom has got to come first. You've got to know your own mind first. The more you have this, the more wise you are in advising others. But I think you can never fail with these kids who come to you for their karate, right? Or karate, isn't it? Self-defense. Self-defense. Then they adore you, Hamida. They rely upon you. You're like their mentor. Just admire them and pray. You, I, I know how you feel, darling. You can do really well. You can manage it, I guarantee. And give them a big hug. I swear to you, that'll be better than a million pieces of other advice. Do you understand? Time to go, I think. We can finish now. Well, I have to finish now anyway. But seeing as I talk fast, you've, it's now about four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that as a stupid joke, but it's kind of true. <laughs> okay, you people. So we finish with a little prayer. This two, one, one and three quarter hours we've been together. The Buddha would say there's nothing gone astray. Everything has gone in. Everything's gone into our memory. Everything's stored there. So we think how amazing. And another way to think about it is every thought we've had has sown a seed. So may we nourish these seeds from this moment forward with our practice, our effort, whatever that is, you know. So we can continue to work on ourselves, develop our amazing quality so we could be a benefit to others. That's the idea. And another little prayer. Just making aspiration that body compassion grow and grow in the hearts of all. Kewaji nyu du dag lama sange drub gyurne drowa chi kyang malupa dei sala 
Pashog Jang Chob Sem Chog Rin Boche Maki Panam Kegutig Ke Panyam Pa Me Payang Gong Ne Gong Du Herba Shog. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Happy to see you all. All right. Thank you very much, Venerable Carol. Thank you, everybody.